Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Um, we're so excited to have this webinar today, COVID-19 Amplifying Young Voices. Um, this is the first in a series of two webinars organized by the Global Unions to discuss young workers' issues within and across sectors in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, and to explore issues that ensure young workers and their needs and aspirations are included in decision-making during and beyond the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there will be interpretation during this webinar, if you are on the Zoom platform, into English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, Russian, and Japanese. In your Zoom box at the bottom, you can find the button that says interpretation. If you click on that button, you can find uh, your correct channel. For Arabic speakers, please use the Chinese channel. For all questions that you want to pose to the speakers, please use the Q&A channel at the bottom of the screen. My name is Anna Fendley. Um, I'm a member of the United Steelworkers Union in the United States and am also the chair of the ITUC Youth Committee. Um, I will be joined today moderating this webinar with Eduardo Magaldi from UGT Spain. Um, and he's also on the Zoom platform. And we have six wonderful speakers today. The reason we're here though is even before the pandemic, young workers were disproportionately represented in precarious or non-permanent forms of work, including agency, temporary and informal work. These types of jobs are, are commonly have low labor rights and protections, low wages, poor working conditions and a lack of access to social protection. Before this crisis, unemployment and underemployment of young people was very high. Youth unemployment rates were about three times higher for young workers than they were for the rest of the adult population. Around one fifth of young people worldwide were not in employment, education, or training. And the social and economic consequences of, the, of this pandemic have simply exacerbated that situation with young, work, young women being disproportionately affected compared to young men. We're witnessing high numbers of young people in regions like Asia and Africa who have been on the cusp of entering the labor market now in a COVID-19 world where they are now being forced into massive, unanticipated, and in many cases, devastating trans transformation that impacts their long-term employment. According to the ILO, more than one in six young people are out of work due to the pandemic. One of the reasons is that young people account for many of the workers in the very hard hit sectors like services, tourism, accommodations, retail, and manufacturing. And for those of us on the older end of the young worker spectrum, um, Many of us were just entering the world of work when the 2008-2009 global financial crisis erupted. And this is the, the second major crisis in our working lives. So we have a lot to talk about today. Um, we have six wonderful speakers. Um, Eduardo and I are going to ask some questions and we will also uh, have some opportunity for those of you from the the audience to ask some questions as well. To get us started, um, I think we should introduce our speakers and ask them to share just very briefly how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted them as a young worker. So first I'd like to introduce Felia Wilson. Um, she is from St. Lucia. Uh, representing the ITF, the Tourism Sector Global Union. She's a, stop, a shop steward, vice chair of the ITF Regional Dockers and vice chair of the ITF Regional Youth Committee. 
Uh, she's a member of the ITF Global Youth Committee, and she is a docker and she's supporting the tourism project ITF has in the region. Philia, can you tell us how COVID-19 has impacted you? Hi, good morning to all. COVID-19 hmm, has been very stressful. I cannot only speak for myself, but it pains me that it has affected me to see my young worker colleagues being unemployed, being just at a standstill, everything has stopped. Uh, the stresses of job loss, the fear of alienation, retardation of career improvements, all of those things has been an ailing cry for us in terms of COVID-19. Um, there is generally um, this feeling for me in terms of uncertainty, uncertainty in what will come post COVID-19 and how young workers will be able to fit into whatever conversations that our governments and our unions are having. Thank you, Felia. Next, I'd like to introduce Monica Buffon. Uh, Monica is from the Contag Union in Brazil, which is uh, agriculture sector. She is uh, chair of the IUF Young Workers Committee and the secretary of the Young and Rural Workers of Contag. Monica, how has COVID-19 impacted you as a young worker? Is Monica with us today? Okay, it looks like she's having connectivity issues, so we will come back to her. Um, we'll move on to a different part of the world and a different sector. Uh, Gopi uh, Panir Silvam, you'll have to correct that. I'm sure I, I butchered it. Um, from India. He's from the All Indian Building and Construction Workers Union. Uh, he's the president of the youth wing of his union and a member of the BWI International Youth Committee. Um, Gopi, how has the pandemic impacted you? Yes, good evening to all. Uh, uh, thanks for the uh, night. Uh, in, uh, in India, at the time of the uh, sudden lockdown, workers who working with me uh, get more shocked at the situation. For more than 60 days at the beginning, we couldn't get proper food, any help from government, police, and uh, not allow us to go out to buy any daily needs and medical treatment also. And again, uh, we had some um, uh, money problem also. We had uh, we had earned some money in hands, which we earned. Uh, at the, at the, before lockdown, we used to give to our family and we have a little money and cross the day. At the lockdown situation, where we stayed in the construction site, it was uh, full and, uh, construction site and the road was fully affected by 20 people who were affected in COVID-19. And the road was fully uh, closed by the uh, metal sheets. Uh, for more than 40 days, we were uh, suffered in the, in the, in the, in the, in the place. Uh, we couldn't get any proper uh, foods and any basic needs, anything from the in, in the street. We, uh, we, get, we informed our... Hi, Gopi. Can I just interrupt you for a moment? The interpreters are asking if you can speak just a little closer to the microphone. So you're getting, you're getting at it? Are you hearing my voice? Yes, if you can just speak a little closer to the microphone. Uh, hello. Are you okay now? Hello? Yes, hopefully that's better. Oh. Well, it looks like maybe we've lost Gopi for the moment. Um, technical difficulties. I, we can come back and let him finish his explanation of, of the impacts on him um, and the workers in his union in India. Um, 
for now, we can move on. Again, we're, we're moving around the world. Um, our next panelist is Rebecca Sepulveda Carrasco. Uh, Rebecca is from Chile. She is uh, representing PSI and the health sector, and she is a member of her union's youth committee. Rebecca, are you there? How? There you are. Wonderful. Hola. Agradezco la invitación para representar a la Internacional de Servicios Públicos en este evento. Antes, quisiera señalar que la pandemia por COVID-19 vino a demostrar el fracaso del modelo neoliberal para enfrentar problemáticas sanitarias, económicas y sociales como las que estamos viviendo ahora. En América Latina y el Caribe, lo cotidiano de un trabajador de la salud se ha alterado y ha producido cambios profundos en nuestras vidas laborales y personales. Un problema central ha sido la falta de elementos de protección personal, un aumento de carga laboral, disminución de los tiempos de descanso, ha aumentado los riesgos psicosociales. También nos hemos visto enfrentados a discriminación por parte de la población debido al vínculo estrecho que tenemos con la enfermedad. Hemos experimentado temor a contagiarnos con la enfermedad y contagiar a nuestros seres queridos. Muchos trabajadores de la salud no han podido llegar a sus hogares y pasan largos periodos de tiempo en residencias sanitarias para evitar contagiar a los suyos. Las autoridades han debido aumentar al personal sanitario de primera línea y estos puestos mayoritariamente han sido ocupados por jóvenes, pero en contratos precarios de trabajo carentes de derechos. Los trabajadores y las trabajadoras de la salud estamos viviendo tiempos difíciles y complejos, pero no hemos dejado de hacer lo que corresponde. Y esto nos ha reafirmado que debemos seguir luchando por servicios públicos de calidad y trabajo decente. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker, our next panelist is Dennis Otuo. Uh, Dennis is also in the health sector. He is from the Health Service Workers Union in Ghana, also representing UNI, uh, Global Union, the care sector. And Dennis is a member of the UNI Africa Youth Committee and the national youth chairperson for his union. Dennis, can you talk a little bit about your experience in Ghana? Okay, um, thank you very much, Anna. So um, the um, the terrain has been quiet and certain um, since uh, the lockdown was instituted. That was um, between April um, and May. Now we come in personally. I had to struggle um, with um, issues of transportation because once um, the lockdown was instituted, um, healthcare workers who fall under essential workforce had to still commute to and fro work. And so we had to do this. Uh, most buses were not operating at the time where we had to struggle to go to and back from work. Um, some colleagues, unfortunately, have had to um, be let go. I'm talking of um, the, um, that's the uh, casual workers. Some have had to be let go. Others have had to deal with reduced um, salaries um, because um, of the um, pandemic and then the area we find ourselves in now. But uh, on the whole, um, it's, 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 it's quite uncertain because now nobody knows what the future has for us. We come to work, it's like, if you move, if you move around the country now, it's like people have forgotten the, the, the virus exists. But um, those of us in the health um, um, sector, we see, we see um, cases, some really bad cases from uh, day in, day out. And we know that it's still around us, so we have to cope, and then we have to be innovative enough to ensure that um, the diseases, uh, the disease does not stay with us for long. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Gopi, let's try this again. Let's go back and hear about your experience in in the building and construction workers union in India. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry for the uh, sudden uh, problem. Uh, at the time of sudden lockdown, 
uh, workers who working at, with me uh, get more uh, shocked at the situation of the sudden lockdown. For more than 60 days at the beginning, we couldn't get proper food, any help from the government. Uh, police not allow us to go out to buy any daily needs or medical treatment also. Uh, we had uh, earned some money uh, in hands uh, uh, at the time of the lockdown, which we, uh, which half of the money was given to our family and half of the money was with, uh, we used in the, uh, in the lockdown time. Uh, after the lockdown situation, we have stayed at a, at a place uh, where we were working. Uh, at, the road, at, the, at the place, the road was closed by two sides with the metal sheets. Uh, more than more of, more than 20 persons of the COVID patients were suffered there. So we, uh, we totally get stuck at the situation because uh, we are the young workers, uh, all, uh, uh, it is new to us. So we get shocked and uh, uh, suffered a lot for the 40 days in the same place. Uh, we couldn't get any foods from that uh, place. Uh, some of the uh, persons who are staying uh, outside, they helped us to give, get back foods uh, to, for, for us. Um, it is, it is a, uh, so it is new for us. Thank you. Thank you, Gopi. Um, and I'll just remind all of our attendees, uh, if you joined a couple of minutes late, that uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should choose your interpretation language. Um, so you can hear the speakers and understand what they're what they're sharing. Um, let's come back. It sounds like we have Monica on. Um, Monica is uh, from the Agriculture Workers Union in Brazil. Um, she's chair of the IUF Young Workers Committee and the secretary of the Young and Rural Workers of Contag, her union. Uh, Monica, can you tell us a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted you as a young worker? Olá, muito bom dia a todos e todas. E já boa tarde para alguns lugares. Aqui no Brasil é, é nove horas da manhã, né? É, desculpe pelo atraso, equívoco de horários. Mas, para nós, aqui, enquanto jovens agricultores e agricultoras, nós tivemos muitos é, impactos mesmo com a chegada do Covid. Primeiro, por ser uma questão que a gente não estava, de fato, ninguém preparado para esse momento. Nem, é, nem trabalhadores urbanos, nem trabalhadores rurais, em especial a parte rural, porque, de fato, não temos tantas estruturas que possam estar trabalhando para é comercializar os nossos produtos. E aí, de uma certa forma, é, para mim, enquanto jovem, esse grande impacto ele veio é, principalmente pela não realização do nosso quarto festival nacional da juventude rural, que iria acontecer né, entre os dias 5 a 7 de maio. Era uma grande ação voltada para toda a juventude rural, onde a gente trabalha aí com a perspectiva de mais de 5 mil jovens na capital federal do Brasil. E é uma grande ação né, de luta é, e de direito de todos os jovens trabalhadores rurais e também jovens urbanos, né, jovens é, de todos os sindicatos e todas as dificuldades do trabalho nas nossas atividades sindicais. Então, para a gente é, foi esse grande impacto e, e também ter que ficar longe da família, para mim foi esse grande impacto, a gente é, não, não poder ficar tão perto, né? O medo que se assolou é, para nós, enquanto juventude, né? Pois ainda com tantos sonhos, para mim e milhares de jovens, e de repente tudo ter que parar, é, então isso foi uma insegurança muito grande. A insegurança por ter um presidente como o Bolsonaro, é, no comando do país, então isso também nos gera muita preocupação e uma incerteza de que tudo o que estava por vir e ainda a gente está passando por esse grande caos. Então esses foram grandes impactos aí que o Covid tem causado e a gente ainda sem saber a que momento né, isso vai passar então, grandes impactos de insegurança para nós enquanto juventude, falando em especial aqui nessa pergunta, né, para mim, enquanto jovem rural, mas jovem também que hoje está olhando por toda a juventude, tanto rural quanto urbana. Muito obrigada. Obrigada. 
Thank you, Monica. Very glad that you're able to join us. Um, our, our final panelist to introduce is Christian Rutendo Ranji. Uh, she is from Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Energy Workers Union, um, which is an industrial affiliate. And she works at a public water utility um, and is the National Youth Committee chairperson for her union. And also holds the position of secretary of the national Indust of the industrials youth committee in Zimbabwe. Um, Christian, I, I will ask you the same question. Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted you as a young worker? Thank you, Anna. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I can see from the screen um, my network is a little bit bad, especially when I use the, the video mode. But I will just try to be brief on the implications of COVID-19 on myself and the youth at large. Uh, we were affected by COVID-19 pandemic um, in terms of our devaluation of our salary, whereby inflation took a toll on us and uh, the purchasing power of our salaries became very low and our capitalist employers, they took advantage of the shutdown not to then uh, engage in CBA collective bargaining for us to look at the conditions of, uh, for us to look at improving the conditions of service of the employees and even to cushion the workers because of the inflation rate that is increased by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was so much touched by, by, by the health sector, whereby we saw the workers in the health sector, those that are at the forefront of fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, going to work without protective clothing. They didn't get proper PPE to effectively carry out their duties. And they went on to an extent of uh, downing tools because the employer was very adamant in supplying the required PPE for them to effectively carry out their duties. And most families that are in the informal sector were also affected adversely by the COVID-19 pandemic because they had no form of livelihood, they had no form of survival. And in most cases, the youth do not have a social life. As you know that the youth, they need to socialize. We lost our social life because the transport sector was partially closed it's not completely closed and you end up spending most of your time queuing for the few buses that the government uh, were willing to then put on the road for the workers to then move from point A to point B. And in some cases, some young people that have uh, chronic diseases, they could not move from point A to point B because of the stringent measures that were put in place by the government for one to move from point A to point B, for even to move from your home, to go to the pharmacy, to get your medication, like for diabetes and other chronic diseases. So for me, it impacted so much on the youth and the people in Zimbabwe so much that we didn't have even, the health sector was in shambles because the nurses and the doctors could not attend to us because they didn't have product PPE. And they wanted to then protect themselves because you can't fight the disease whilst you're not protecting yourself because you also have the family to look after. So basically, that's what COVID-19 did to us in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas eh, por esta primera exposición y situación de cómo os ha afectado el COVID en vuestros trabajos y también en, en vuestro entorno. Eh, bueno, me presentó Ana eh, al comienzo. Yo soy Eduardo, eh, voy, a, voy a moderar con ella esta, este webinar. Eh, queríamos aprovechar una, una segunda pregunta o esta segunda pregunta dirigida a los panelistas, porque en muchas ocasiones estamos hablando de cómo es el, el impacto económico 
o en el trabajo de, de la COVID, de la pandemia, pero no nos dicen o, o, o no nos centramos tanto en, en el impacto eh, sector por sector y aquí tenemos la suerte de poder contar con, con seis panelistas de seis sectores eh, muy diferentes entre ellos y queríamos aprovecharlo para, para poder dirigir un poquitín y que nos explicaran cómo, cómo ha afectado en, en, su, en los diferentes sectores. Eh, voy a intentar eh, retomar el, el orden de intervenciones que teníamos anterior, eh, deciros a los asistentes, aprovechar que nos podéis preguntar, podéis lanzar también preguntas y después habrá un turno de, de preguntas que les haremos a los panelistas, lo podéis escribir en la pestaña de preguntas y respuestas, ¿de acuerdo? Y bueno, eh, vamos con, con la primera pregunta eh, que es para Felia. Eh, ella es de, de una isla donde el sector turístico es un pilar fundamental eh, para, para la economía y de repente ha saltado una, una alarma mundial que limita eh, muchísimo la, la movilidad de las personas y, y, y del turismo también. Así que creo que eres la, la persona perfecta para explicarnos cuál ha sido el impacto de, de las condiciones laborales para los trabajadores jóvenes en, en el sector. Thank you. The impact for young workers working in this tourism sector has been a huge loss. Our country and our region depends on tourism heavily. We have a lot of young workers who are employed on cruise ships and in the tourism sector. For them, everything is a nightmare in terms of their job security. Um, we have young workers who are on cruise ships out there in the world and they needed to come back home and it was scary because there was just this total halt in terms of cruise ships, in terms of employment, the tourism sector, the aviation sector, all of those. We were hard hit by this pandemic. Our region, like I said, heavily thrives on tourism and um, we find that young workers, they are out there, most of them not sure of how well they could fit into getting um, a sense of income as a result of COVID. Primarily what they were trained to do was in the hospitality sector. Now that COVID has come, everyone is on layoff. There's a, a great bit of uncertainty. You find in the hotel sector, there are layoffs and extended layoffs. You find like generally persons who assist the hotel and tourism sector, they are like typically the working times and the scheduling have changed. This would mean like a reduced working hour. For example, the affecting of times with family, especially those who have young children, and most importantly, the psychological stresses and the social dislocation that can result of those. The situation has resulted in general reduced earnings. In many cases, as in the hospitality sector, there has been massive redundancies. This is especially serious when no programs of payroll and income support that even attempts to be comprehensive has been rolled out. For young workers who are about to undertake significant life impacting ventures, for example, building a home, undertaking a small business, etc., these have been put on hold indefinitely or rendered virtually impossible. This has meant there's a lot of unprecedented uncertainty that is psychologically distressing for themselves, for their young families, and for the wider extended families in our region. Gracias, eh, Felia, por, por esta exposición. Eh, la verdad es que es muy grande la incertidumbre que, que, que ha generado en, en, en nuestras vidas el, el COVID. Eh, gracias por, por la exposición. Eh, ahora quería hacer, dar paso a, a Mónica eh, también para hacerle una pregunta que nos explique eh, cómo ha sido el impacto de la COVID en el sector de, en el sector de la agricultura y, que, y cuáles han sido los principales problemas que, que han visto. É, muito obrigada. É, então, assim, o primeiro dos impactos assim, que nós tivemos e ainda nós estamos tendo é que nós temos um governo 
é, que de fato ele não tem respeitado as recomendações da, da Organização Mundial da Saúde e não tem uma política de protocolo de segurança. Então, isso é um impacto muito grande para toda a nossa população. A agricultura familiar, ela é uma atividade essencial e nós não estamos tendo apoio é, para comercialização com segurança dos nossos produtos enquanto agricultores e agricultoras. É, o auxílio emergencial né, que foi é, trabalhado aqui no Brasil e diante também de, de diversos países, ele não foi, é, é, o governo vetou esse auxílio para a nossa agricultura familiar. Então, assim, nos dificultou muito para que a gente possa continuar produzindo e escoando a nossa produção com segurança. É, na zona rural hoje, praticamente 70% dos nossos agricultores e agricultoras do Brasil, eles não têm internet na zona rural. Então, implica muito na comercialização, como a agricultura é uma atividade essencial, então, como escoar essa produção também de uma forma segura. É, a internet, ela ajuda muito e hoje é uma dificuldade para nós. A questão da, do estudo também, né, as escolas fechadas, então a juventude não está tendo condições de estudar, de acompanhar as aulas da forma que estão sendo feitas remotas, então esse é um impacto muito grande. As nossas cidades do interior já estão sendo responsáveis por mais de 60% é, de casos do covid é, e a saúde está um caos, né? As cidades pequenas, que a gente fala aqui, cidade do interior, elas não têm mais recursos, não têm mais leito para suportar é, todos e todas. E aí eu quero trazer um exemplo da minha cidade, uma cidade de interior mesmo, nós já temos é, sete mortos, então às vezes assim, ah, sete, né? Dentro de tantos que a gente já tem no Brasil, mas para a gente é um impacto muito grande, porque são sete pessoas que são agricultores, sete pessoas que são é, do interior, que são produtores de alimento, então isso nos deixa muito preocupado. E um dos grandes impactos que nós estamos vendo para a nossa juventude também, é, com todo esse caos, o crescimento, né, como a companheira também disse anteriormente, é da própria saúde mental da nossa juventude. No Brasil, a faixa etária do os mortos pelo Covid-19 é entre 19 e 45 anos. Então, para a gente é considerado um público jovem e esse público é um público de baixa renda, é, onde não está conseguindo ter uma alimentação saudável e que não está conseguindo ter acesso às políticas públicas. Então, assim, as políticas públicas que a gente ainda tem não está conseguindo chegar até esse público. Então, para a gente, esses são grandes impactos voltados para o setor da agricultura, mas também para o setor das pessoas que são menos favorecidas por políticas é, referenciadas pelo governo. Então, esses são os nossos maiores impactos. Obrigada. Muchas gracias, Mónica. Eh, aprovecho para recordaros que, que por favor, seáis un poquitín breves, que, hay, que os ciñáis a los tres minutos que os hemos pedido para que después eh, podamos meter las preguntas también del, del resto de asistentes. Eh, ahora doy, doy paso a, a Gopi. Eh, sabemos que hay eh, muchos trabajadores eh, migrantes y que este ha sido... Eh, uno de los colectivos más, más eh, vulnerables durante la pandemia. Y quería preguntarte eh, cuáles han sido eh, los problemas más importantes de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras jóvenes migrantes en la región de Asia-Pacífico. Okay. Uh, workers all over Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore have been affected, especially ones who depend on daily wages. The last minute announcement of the lockdown Uh, caused a tragedy for uh, migrant workers uh, who had to walk for thousand kilometers to, to return home from big, from big cities. This journey has uh, unfortunately uh, been fatal for some of them. More young workers lost their lives due to travel back to their uh, hometown. Uh, we, uh, we, we lost our jobs, family affected more due to the loss in their savings. Young workers affected due to mental pressure and feeling unconditional due to the homesick. Um, mainly youth workers can't reach their co-workers, can't help workers due to this uh, strict lockdown. Under the circumstances, uh, there is a ultimate need of uh, strong power to the fight against uh, 
predicted side effects of the virus of labor market young workers need unions more than ever ever now and now is an important time for uh, unions to create a new space in which young workers can determine the future of the movement young workers should take part in negotiations with the companies and governments and take initiative to run the campaigns to defend their rights and to raise the public awareness on the realities of the pandemic it should be stressed that since young workers can be uh, critical ill and even die they should also uh, be protected at the same level of necessary ohs measurement at workplaces uh, most of most workers that attempt labor migrations uh, are targeted by migration requirement agencies because they live uh, in low income countries and they are generally uh, young young workers may be best migrant workers because they are uh, strong hard working and have only a limited knowledge of the rights rights at work uh, young workers generally uh, have next to say no savings however the best th targets also have a young family in young family otherwise young debuts this means that even the pandemic hit the uh, they had extremely limited and uh, financially options now to protect themselves workers accommodations uh, is a major concern in the uh, content of covid 19 most migrant work com workers accommodations is very cramped and makes social distancing next to impossible at the same time most uh, workers proceeds on a no work no pay basis which means the most migrant workers have been both with uh, without work and without income migrant workers are thus uh, doubly uh, endangered they can't afford not not to work uh, but often they also uh, cannot relocate or find their other work the market has failed them and uh, state must interview thank you gracias gracias gopi um, ahora quería dar paso a, a rebeca y que nos que nos explicara primero nos ha hecho una exposición de, de cómo de cómo ha afectado al, al sector sanitario al sector de la salud y quería preguntarle si para ella eh, ve también um, diferencias en cómo ha afectado entre hombres y mujeres y si nos puede contar eh, su experiencia en este sentido. Sí, Eduardo, el impacto ha sido diferente para hombres y para mujeres. Hay que partir señalando que el área de la salud es un área económica feminizada. Las mujeres representamos alrededor del 70 al 80% de la mano de obra del sector público de salud. Pero quisiera detenerme en cuatro aspectos que, que son relevantes para presentar la diferencia. Primero, tiene que ver con la sobrecarga laboral. Si bien es cierto, para todos ha aumentado, por la, por la pandemia ha aumentado las jornadas de trabajo, han sido extensas, hemos tenido que someternos a horas, a, a horas extras de trabajo, esta carga laboral es aún mayor por el trabajo productivo, reproductivo y no remunerado y las labores domésticas que realizan las mujeres. Y esto es porque históricamente este trabajo ha sido delegado a las mujeres. Pensemos que en periodo normal las mujeres realizan tres horas más de trabajo no remunerado, doméstico, que los hombres. Y este periodo de tiempo puede ser aún mayor cuando hay niños en el hogar. Y tenemos que pensar que en este periodo de pandemia los niños se encuentran en el hogar. Un ejemplo, una trabajadora de la salud realiza su turno de trabajo en un hospital, luego realiza horas extras de trabajo en el establecimiento y cuando llega a su hogar debe realizar labores de cuidado de sus hijos, educativos y labores domésticas. El otro punto tiene que ver con las labores de cuidado. Y acá las medidas de confinamiento lo que han hecho es que se tienen que cerrar los centros educativos de la primera infancia y también se han cerrado escuelas. Y aparte, tampoco las mujeres en este periodo hemos podido recurrir a familiares para que cuiden a los niños. Entonces se ha sobrecargado esta labor de cuidado en las mujeres. Pero no solo el cuidado de niños, la labor que se ha sobrecargado en las mujeres, sino que también el cuidado de adultos mayores o de personas en situación de discapacidad. El tercer punto que quisiera nombrar tiene que ver con la atención y el temor de la vida laboral y familiar. 
Algunos trabajadores de salud por miedo a enfermar a sus familias, en especial a sus hijos o familiares enfermos, han tenido que separarse de sus familias durante todo el periodo de pandemia y dejar a sus hijos con familiares, debiendo soportar esta carga emocional de la separación. Por último, quisiera nombrar la violencia doméstica, que es un tema que es un poco invisible, que poco se ha hablado, pero que existe y que se ha incrementado en este periodo de pandemia. Y tiene que ver porque las trabajadoras han tenido que pasar más tiempo con su agresor y esto ha provocado una exacerbación de las acciones de violencia de género y las tensiones internas en el hogar. Muchas gracias, eh, Rebeca, por, por exponernos ¿no? también la diferencia que, que, que hay muchas veces o cómo nos afecta a hombres y, y a mujeres de manera diferente eh, esta, esta pandemia. Eh, quería recuperar eh, a Denise para, porque hemos visto varios, eh, varios informes sobre el aumento de los casos de, de violencia y de acoso a muchos trabajadores en sectores como la atención, o los call centers o los servicios de reparto y quería preguntarte eh, si esto es cierto y qué tipo de, de violencia han sufrido las personas trabajadores jóvenes durante la pandemia. Ok, um, thank you very much. Um... Some workers are exposed to higher levels of violence, particularly third party violence, because their jobs involve particularly dangerous and unsafe interactions with third parties. These may include clients, um, customer, uh, customer service providers, users, and even patients or members of the general public. Third party violence refers to violence at the workplace and covers insults and threats as well as physical aggression that is disrespectful and hurtful and causes injury. This has been particularly true for the frontline responders, such as ambulance staff and healthcare workers. We can all bear witness to how the pandemic sent uh, most of the world into lockdown. But in doing so, other services became considered as essential, such as commerce, call centers, postal, to respond to the demands of society. During the pandemic, uh, most people became agitated by the restrictions, long queues, and limited stock of goods. Some of these frustrations were directed to uni has seen alarming rates of verbal, psychological, and physical abuse towards workers during this pandemic. Union of Shop Distributive and Allied Workers in UK has reported that abusive incidents towards shop workers have doubled since the coronavirus outbreak. This report, they report that each individual, if in each individual shop worker is on the average assaulted or threatened or even abused every 6.5 uh, days. Another aspect of violence worth mentioning is the domestic violence. Domestic violence is on the rise as millions of workers in lockdown or asked to work from home. Since the beginning of the lockdown, countries such as France saw increases of 32% in just one week. Whilst in UK, domestic abuse calls were up by 25%. Whilst um, that was the beginning of the shutdown or the lockdown. In Australia, it has been between 40 to 70 percent whereas in colombia it has the situation is no different in south africa which has one of the highest femicide rates in the world with more than 2700 women being killed every year 20 women has been killed by their partners by the first week of confinement this is the reason this is why international instruments such as convention 190 and recommendation 206 which talks about violence and harassment conventions are essential. This instrument will help protect um, workers throughout the country uh, and their workplace, whereas the workforce, uh, whether the workplace is in their living room, their office or a shop, we definitely need to push now for more 
than ever the ratification of all these um, conventions so that the unions include them in their collective agreements as well as negotiations. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Denise. La verdad es que esto que nos has expuesto es, es una barbaridad. Eh, por último, quería dar paso a, a Cristian del, del sector de energía, eh, que también me gustaría que nos explicaras eh, cómo ha sido el impacto de la pandemia en las, en las personas jóvenes de, de tu sector. Cristian, eh, no sé si, si la hemos perdido o si realmente no, no ha llegado el, la interpretación aún, si estamos teniendo problemas de, de audio. Bueno, parece que, parece que sí, eh, así que eh, bueno, intentaremos recuperar esta, esta pregunta para, para Cristian más, más tarde. Eh, y vamos a ir avanzando en las preguntas que nos habéis ido trasladando los asistentes. Habéis sido eh, bastante participativos. Así que eh, os pedimos a los, a los panelistas que, que seáis concisos en, en las respuestas para, para que puedan entrar todas las preguntas. Y, y si alguien más tiene alguna otra cuestión y quiere seguir enviándolas, eh, os recordamos que es eh, abajo en, en la sección de, de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, la primera pregunta es para, para Rebeca y nos preguntan eh, si has experimentado o encontrado pro, eh, problemas de salud mental entre los trabajadores jóvenes debido a, al COVID. Y si es así, eh, ¿cómo, se, ¿cómo se han manejado o cómo, o cómo se pueden manejar este tipo, este tipo de problemas? Sí, la verdad es que se ha encontrado problemas de salud mental por la sobrecarga laboral, el miedo a enfermarse, el miedo a contagiar a sus familias, la falta de descanso que tienen las y los trabajadores. Y como dije anteriormente, los puestos de trabajo que están en primera línea y que son las que se enfrentan con el virus directamente, virus del COVID, eh, están ocupados principalmente por trabajadores y trabajadores jóvenes. Eh, también esa... Esa precariedad laboral también causa este, estos problemas de salud mental. Y lo que se está haciendo es que en varios hospitales se están haciendo iniciativas eh, para poder tratar a estos funcionarios de salud mental, pero no son suficientes. La verdad es que el problema de salud mental para las trabajadoras y trabajadores de la salud va a ser un tema importante de abordar durante la pandemia y post pandemia. Pero se han hecho eh, labores, por lo menos locales, en que, eh, por ejemplo, consultas online para los trabajadores, eh, para que puedan quizás un poco liberar esta carga emocional que tienen, pero va a faltar, es una deuda que vamos a tener por la, con las trabajadoras y trabajadores de la salud y sobre todo con las y los jóvenes. Muchas gracias, Rebeca. Eh, también tenemos eh, una pregunta para Celia. Ella nos ha explicado que hubo despidos masivos en, eh, en el sector y nos pregunta Sultoni del Sindicato de Trabajadores Ferroviarios de Indonesia. Eh, ¿Quiere saber cómo está ayudando el gobierno eh, con, estos, con estos despidos masivos? Si es que está ayudando o están ayudando los gobiernos. Thank you for the question. Yes, there are massive redundancies and we have a national insurance corporation where when, um, when one earns their wages, a percentage of their wages goes to this insurance corporation. So it's a national corporation. And as a result of COVID, cabinet met and there were um, statutory instruments whereby directing that incorporation to assist the laid off and the redundant workers for a period of time 
in the first instance, it would have gone to 12 weeks or so um, in terms of giving them a percentage of the wages that they have earned. For example, it starts from $500 to the ceiling of $1,500. That can assist them and their families in the day-to-day -day expenses, expenses and um, whatever that they need to get, notwithstanding there are other governmental agencies who assist with hot meals to families and um, other basic um, supplies like toiletries, etc. Yes. Thank you. Gracias, Felia. Parece que ya hemos recuperado a, a Cristian. Así que eh, retomamos la pregunta que le, que le habíamos trasladado y era a ver si nos podía explicar cómo ha afectado el impacto de la pandemia en el, en el sector de la energía. Pues parece que, que continuamos con, con problemas de conexión, os, pe, os pedimos disculpas. Eh, pues eh, retomamos la, eh, la, la última pregunta que tenemos, que es para, que es para Rebeca también. Te preguntan si... Cristian, ¿nos oyes? ¿Puede? Ah, parece, que, parece que lo intenta, pero está, está teniendo dificultades. Eh, retomamos la pregunta con Rebeca. Hay muchos... Eduardo. Eduardo. Sí. Yes. I can hear you. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I want to be Sí, sí. Sí, perfecto. Eh, nos, nos gustaría saber eh, cómo, cómo ha afectado eh, la pandemia en, en las personas jóvenes que trabajan en el sector de la energía. Ok, ok. Um, basically, um, the young workers were impacted uh, negatively by retrenchment and layoffs uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in the energy sector and um, the unions they have lost a lot of members because most of the casual and contract workers uh, were laid off um, in May 2020 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yes, the employer said that he cannot continue with the um, employees that are casually employed. And we have seen a lot of workers that were left behind in the energy sector um, having pressure of having to meet deadlines because those that were laid off, it means they more work to the few employees that are available. So there is lots of job security in the energy sector and there is also uncertainty within the few employees that are left because the employer is also giving indication that he's going to lay off more workers that are permanently employed in the energy sector. And we have also seen that um, the project of the renewable energy has been stalled because of um, the restrictions of movement uh, around the globe, whereby we're expecting a lot of uh, things that we're going to use uh, during uh, the installation of the renewable energy project and China being the biggest supplier was the most affected country with the COVID-19 pandemic. So basically the employees were affected in such a way that we were looking at having less pressure at work and now there is more pressure because we have few employees available to do the duties that are need to be done and meeting targets. And also uh, we have seen most workers, especially the young people were forced to go or leave 
but they were not paid for the leave. Yes, the employer should have um, cushioned the employees that were on leave because this was not any, anybody's doing. It was just a pandemic that had come upon us as a, as a, as a nation in Zimbabwe. And also the devaluation of salaries whereby employees were finding it difficult to then look for their families because of the negra salaries they were receiving because the employers were not willing to then come up to negotiate with the workers. They were not even cushioning the employees without even having a meeting or collective bargaining. So the employees were finding it difficult to then look, look for their families, provide for their families, at the same time having pressure at work. And they were not even being paid over time for the pressure that they were getting at work. So basically, the South energy sector was affected with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Cristian. Eh, retomamos la, la pregunta que le estaba lanzando también a, a Rebeca sobre eh, la gente que nos ha ido poniendo preguntas en, en, en el chat. Y quería preguntarte o, o, o te preguntan si hay muchos trabajadores subcontratados entre las trabajadoras de la salud en tu país. Bueno, subco o sea, hay un contrato en mi país que se llama compra de servicios y honorarios. Los compra de servicios, que es un contrato que es precario, es un contrato que se hace a una empresa de servicios. Y hay un número no menor de jóvenes que se encuentran en este tipo de contratos precarios de trabajo. Como dato, en Chile el gobierno lanzó un, eh, un seguro de vida para los funcionarios que murieran a causa del COVID. Y este seguro no cubre a estos funcionarios de salud que trabajan en primera línea en este tipo de contrato precario y sin derechos laborales y que son subcontratados. De acuerdo, Rebeca. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, una pregunta más para, para Denise. Eh, ¿Qué ha hecho el sindicato para ayudar a los trabajadores jóvenes con contratos de, de corta duración y que han perdido su trabajo? Y también para los, eh, para los otros jóvenes que, que todavía están trabajando. Ok, thank you very much. Um, fortunately for us, most of the workers within the health um, sector have long-term um, contracts. But um, for casual workers or those who don't have um, long-term contracts that are being paid, they have been encouraged to join the union and the union defends them in such cri uh, crisis. So, for instance, um, workers, um, permanent workers or um, workers with long-term contracts have been um, have gotten some alleviations from government. We've had, we've had instances where um, the government has granted um, a tax waiver, 100% tax waiver for three months. That was effective from April to June, April, May, and June, three months, 100% uh, tax waivers for all health workers. And then they even went ahead and then negotiated for a 50% um, increase in the basic salary of, all, um, of frontline workers. So this, this are just, um, this are certain in incentives that were put in place to ensure that um, health workers are um, comfortable to also render the services they are mandated to do. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, those, um, you know, um, incentives do not cut across for um, contract workers or what we call casual workers because um, they have, they are not being paid from the government, it's not, it's, it's not centralized. They are being paid from the um, facilities, that's the individual organizations. So with them, they've been able to get into a con um, some agreement such that no one is laid off within this, this, within this period. And uh, with that, they also have certain assurances such that uh, PPEs are provided for them at all times and uh, the basic, uh, basic requirements are made such that it doesn't go against the collective agreements that was signed with these organizations. Thank you.
Muchas gracias, Denis. Eh, estamos teniendo muchas preguntas sobre cuál es el papel o qué han hecho los sindicatos en, durante la pandemia, cuál ha sido nuestra reacción y, y defensa de los, de los trabajadores. Como el siguiente panel va sobre, va sobre esto concretamente, eh, las vamos a dejar para que sean ellos en ese panel los que, los que nos las expliquen. Así que, por último, tenemos una, una pregunta más que no va dirigida a una persona en concreto, va, va en general, y es eh, ¿cómo, perdón, eh, cómo ha sido el, el teletrabajo o cómo ha afectado el teletrabajo eh, a los trabajadores jóvenes en, en los diferentes sectores. Um, okay, let me take this one. So um, I would say uh, yes, it has, because um, many young workers are new to the workplace, such that they suffer from additional stress and um, anxiety. So they they are new to the job, and it makes it harder for them to even have guidance in terms of the work, especially since there are expectations of employers. Uh, the expectations of employees may not be known. So, for example, we have instances where people um, work from home or work remotely and do not even know when to stop, just, in a, just as a way to impress um, employees in this, in, this, um, um, in this pandemic. So it happens that one may be driving and we have to receive a call one may be, um, it might be past the working time. So if I were to come to the office, say, at, and close at 5 p.m., I might, uh, even after 5 p.m., I, I might have to be online or be answering calls or be responding to clients. So that is where uh, we channel it through the, the rights to, um, where, where we channel it through so that uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there is, there is that communication. So people suffer from um, a lot of anxiety when they work through uh, tele, through when they work remotely, let me just put it that way. So there's a right to disconnect us. Well. That's where you need to know, that is where you need, I think you need another international affiliates are pushing it so that we know when exactly to disconnect, that's the right to disconnect, so that you know exactly when to say stop. If I'm driving, my personal safety is at risk. I know when to pick a call, when not to pick a call, so that uh, my safety is also assured. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, Eduardo, for um, taking all those questions from the attendees. Um, it's wonderful that we've gotten so many about what unions are doing, of course, we are all union members here and we know that our collective power is um, stronger and it's how we, we can most effectively drive change. Um, the pandemic has shown a lot of different things for unions around the world. Um, for example, in Sweden, they've had a massive surge of unionization as a result of the pandemic. Um, where I live in the United States, unions are on the front lines, the main ones fighting for worker protections. Um, so we have a number of questions for the panelists about what their unions are doing um, in their countries. So maybe we'll start with Felia. Uh, how do young workers within your union organize to face issues on their employment and working conditions? And I'll ask all the panelists just to try to keep your answer brief so we can get to everyone. So, Philia. Thank you for the question. Young workers in our region organize to face those issues of our unions based on solidarity, coming together, meeting, informal communication. We meet on social media, we use platforms to discuss any issues that we have and by doing so we take it to they take it to the, the reps and um, it is being um, heard by the unions and a lot of conversations in terms of all aspects um, 
job security, health and safety, what is next? And um, in, in essence, what really can our unions do for us right now? Thank you. Thank you, Philia. Um, we'll go to Monica in the agriculture sector in Brazil. How has your union worked with young worker members to combat these issues and help them secure and access their rights as workers? Bom, eu digo sempre que nós estamos tendo que nos reinventar nesse momento, né, para que a gente possa assegurar os direitos dos nossos trabalhadores e trabalhadoras, em especial a nossa juventude, e manter o ânimo, né, porque a gente precisa manter a nossa organização, precisa manter as pessoas firmes, é, e manter o ânimo, né, dessa, principalmente da juventude, mesmo sem poder se aglomerar. Este, é, este sem reinventar não é fácil, pois as nossas atividades, ela sempre foi muito de olho no olho. Hoje nós estamos usando muitas ferramentas de tecnologia para nos organizar, para manter o diálogo com a nossa base. É, eu falei desde o início que um desafio para a área rural ainda é a internet, né, e que é, se torna para nós hoje uma grande bandeira de luta para que a gente possa conseguir ter essa internet né, na zona rural também. É, nós estamos sempre fazendo muitas reuniões né, com a nossa juventude, com todo o nosso público trabalhador, lives ao vivo de informação, como chegar essas informações até na base, é, com os cuidados necessários dos nossos direitos, é, campanha de arrecadação de alimentos, de máscaras, é, de álcool em gel, para que a gente também possa dar esse suporte para os trabalhadores e trabalhadoras, e trabalhando muito na conscientização da juventude, porque de início né, a juventude era um público que não era o público-alvo, e hoje a gente está vendo como que está sendo afetado. E aí um ponto muito crucial que a gente tem trabalhado é, é no Congresso, com os ataques, são muito grandes por parte do governo, então a CONTAG, juntamente com a CONTAR, juntamente com a UITA, os parlamentares, para que a gente possa garantir os direitos que estão sendo retirados a todos os dias, né? e principalmente os ataques com a juventude, por ser um público que é, é mais fragilizado dentro do mercado de trabalho, então para que possa garantir o trabalho e a condição de trabalho também, porque muitas vezes não estão tendo essa condição de trabalho. Então, mais do que nunca, nós precisamos fortalecer as nossas organizações, porque quem está dentro de um sindicato ainda está conseguindo manter os seus direitos. Então, isso também trabalhando essa sindicalização e essa importância de fortalecer as organizações sindicais. Então, isso que a gente tem trabalhado é frente é, à nossa organização enquanto sindicato, enquanto CONTAI. Muito obrigada. Thank you, Monica. Um, we'll move over to Gopi uh, in India in the construction sector. You talked a little bit earlier about uh, migrant workers. Um, so I wonder if you have uh, some information to share about how your union has helped stranded young migrant workers mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. Yeah, sure. As a young trade unionist, I'm and I'll ask if you witnessed. can get a little closer to the microphone. We can't hear you. <laughs> okay, no? Yeah, okay. As a young trade unionist, I am closely, I have closely witnessed the vulnerable situation of young workers in BWA sector. Our union, AAKT uh, means, Agli India Katida Tolilalarang Madhya Sangam, has extended help to standard migrant workers, in, in, uh, including youth. We assisted workers from North Indian state, Bigar. Unions to union cooperation and contact also have been very helpful, helpful in extending assistance to the workers in different areas. Uh, on Ju July 3rd, unions in India uh, undertook a national wide protest, this uh, dispute lockdown uh, restriction in many places. This happened. Uh, this protest mainly focused on uh, anti labor move and proposals uh, by state government and also uh, long bending 12 points. Uh, challenge of demands uh, and more, more uh, migrants uh, who suffered in the in, in India 
uh, we, we uh, most most of the migrants uh, who, who wanted to go back to the native, uh, we helped them to um, well help them to contact with the government, and we sent more than uh, ten thousand workers by our union, and we help uh, workers by giving food food relief and uh, so many uh, uh, daily basic needs to the workers uh, at the time. And I, I also uh, take this opportunity uh, to th thank our uh, General Secretary, um, uh, Brother uh, B B w General Secretary Mr. Ambed, uh, for giving this uh, solidarity for the uh, movement which was happened on July 3rd. Uh, the AKTM has submitted a representation and appealed the government for their uh, safe return during the lockdown. Uh, the AKTM has stood together with other BWA flights in India, also submitted a representation to the Indian government. Uh, highlighting the uh, highlighting workers issues including youth and migrant impacted by the covid-19 thank you thank you gopi um, i think we have a lot to to learn and to share about how our unions fight for um, public services so rebecca a question for you in chile how does your unions fight for strong quality public services also contribute to the defense of labor rights for young workers like you? Bueno, primero quiero hablar que la Internacional de Servicios Públicos tiene una política y campañas poderosas pro, en pro de los servicios públicos de calidad. Y eso a, entiende que la lucha sin duda alguna tiene que ser con trabajo decente y con trabajo con derechos efectivos. Entonces la defensa del trabajo de las y los jóvenes está integrada dentro del corazón de la política de la Internacional de Servicios Públicos. El COVID ha afectado a los jóvenes en varios ámbitos. Esto fue levantado por la OIT recientemente, con la interrupción de programas educativos, pérdida de empleo, dificultad para encontrar otros empleos. Si bien es cierto, los mayores afectados vamos a ser los jóvenes, esto será aún mayor en las mujeres jóvenes. Estas dificultades los sindicatos debemos ocuparla y deben estar en nuestra agenda de mundo post pandemia. Esto no lo vamos a cambiar solo, entonces la lucha debe ser en conjunto con otros grupos y otros segmentos sindicales. Lo importante es que las organizaciones sindicales y los jóvenes Realicen estudios y catastren la realidad laboral de los jóvenes y las jóvenes en periodo de pandemia y que proyecten escenarios futuros. También lo que deberíamos hacer son mesas de diálogo entre los sindicatos y las autoridades en donde también participen los jóvenes porque la realidad de los jóvenes es diferente a cualquier otra realidad. También debemos promover que los sindicatos, cuando volvamos a la normalidad, se exijan servicios públicos de calidad que sean sensibles al género, en donde se promueva una mayor inversión en estos servicios públicos. La ISP es, tiene una propuesta que es una justicia fiscal justa, en donde las personas que han acumulado riquezas durante más de 30 años contribuyan a salir de la crisis económica. Esto podría ser utilizado por los jóvenes para poder promover una fiscalidad justa y esto puede proporcionarnos una economía y un mundo más justo. Lo que acá también tenemos que promover y que lo dijo Denis en su intervención es la ratificación del convenio 190 de la OIT en contra la violencia y el acoso en el mundo del trabajo. En este sentido queremos celebrar el trabajo que han realizado las compañeras de Argentina en pro de la ratificación de este convenio en su país. En este escenario post pandemia, nosotros como sindicatos debemos pedir a los gobiernos que proporcionen soluciones integrales a los jóvenes. Entonces, si hablamos de recapacitación, es una inversión en el futuro de estos jóvenes que ayudará a reconstruir la economía de nuestros países. Pero toda crisis también trae oportunidades y creatividad. Y el COVID no va a ser una excepción a esto. Y en Chile se han realizado, y en Latinoamérica y el Caribe se han realizado buenas prácticas. Pero puedo nombrar algunas en Chile. En Chile las afiliadas de la ISP están realizando estudios sobre teletrabajo para evaluar el impacto de esta modalidad. 
también se han realizado campañas en redes sociales, lobbies parlamentarios, para la ratificación del Convenio 190. También se han realizado acciones solidarias en que los sindicatos han creado, han fabricado o han realizado entrega de elementos de protección para los funcionarios de la salud. Esto nos ha mantenido estar más presentes y visibles con ellos. Las organizaciones de la salud han hecho catastros diarios sobre funcionarios de la salud contagiados y muertos por el COVID. Esto lo hacen para visibilizar que los trabajadores de la salud no somos héroes, somos trabajadores que necesitamos seguridad y condiciones dignas para desenvolvernos en esta pandemia. Hay una reinvención de la, la manera de hacer sindicalismo y acá todos nos hemos reinventado utilizando plataformas y redes sociales. Para finalizar, me gustaría comentar que las organizaciones de salud estamos haciendo, como, como este seminario en el que estamos participando, también se están realizando seminarios online, online para poder plantear las problemáticas. Estas buenas prácticas nos permiten escucharnos, nos permiten compartir, nos, to, nos permiten tomar la me lo mejor de cada uno para seguir nuestra lucha y alcanzar los derechos, un trabajo decente y servicios públicos de calidad. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we are, I know that we're getting a lot of questions still in the chat box and um, I just want to let everyone know that unfortunately we probably won't have time to answer them today, but please submit them if you have them and we will keep note of them and make sure to include information to help answer those questions on the next webinar um, later this month. Um, Rebecca, you laid out a wonderful vision, forward-looking, thinking about how we can uh, use COVID as an opportunity to build young worker power. Um, I wonder, Dennis, um, in Ghana, you're also in the care sector. Um, as, as the pandemic has been going on, um, we need to help build the power of young workers. We need to organize young workers. So I wonder what has your union been doing? How has it worked to protect its workers during the pandemic? And are those workers happy with the way the union has worked and, and particularly young workers? Okay, thank you very much. So the Health Service Workers Union has been very proactive in this regard. So in a press release dated 16th March this year, the union commended the government for the bold steps taken to avert the rapid spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. It further recommended to governments to respect trade unions and labor rights of members, including their right to move away from imminent hazards in accordance with Act 651 um, of the constitution as well as place all occupational safety and health measures and protocols put in place all occupational safety health and, and health measures and protocols also it asks to be transparent and communicate with health workers to foster trust and a sense of control to decentralize the testing process as recommended by the government um, by the ghana association of medical laboratory scientists health care workers who exhibit who exhibited respiratory symptoms should not provide direct patient care. And when vaccination and treatment became available, the healthcare workforce should be considered a priority for evaluation and treatment. And also to educate public, the public about stigma, stigmatization and discrimination amongst health workers. So it took a series of interventions and through consultations with governments uh, and other state, uh, state agencies, the government gave a 100% tax waiver to all health workers for three months, and that's April, May, and June, as I stated earlier, and then a 50% of uh, basic salary to all frontline workers. Uh, unfortunately, the union is still pushing for the re redefining of the term um, frontline, frontliners to include all health workers, because as of now, it's defined to exclude some. The union is still pushing for redefining of the um, The union is still is pro has provided about 27,000 nose masks and sanitizers to its members since there is erratic and inadequate supply of PPEs by the government. 
The union has also developed electronic training materials, which has been distributed to all union platforms. For effective en engagement, the union is also conducting a series of research to, on how members are faring in these difficult times, and um, um, especially tracking how many of the members have contracted the virus and also finding out why these members are contracting the virus for effective policy engagement. So these are some of the interventions that the union is putting in place. Um, do members want more? Yes, members will definitely ask for more. But for now, this, are the, um, this has um, made members quite excited. And members who, those who were not members, uh, but were found themselves within the health sector, are now also pushing to be part of the union to be able to have some of these um, benefits. From the global perspective, Uni Global has issued guidelines and recommendations for unions who work in care, commerce, postal, among other sectors to protect and support workers during the pandemic. Uni has also issued global, globally special guidelines for returning to work safely for workers who have been working remotely. In terms of youth-specific youth interventions, Uni Youth also sent out recommendations for unions to include youth needs in their work and negotiations during the pandemic. This includes having a contact point for young workers so we have someone to ask questions or raise concerns to, to provide support for young workers to protect our mental health and provide us with psychological and moral support, to gui and guidance and guidelines on remote working, engagement and representing young people in discussions, meetings and decision-making to address the crisis. And finally, have a union emergency response team to help with information, guidance and secure the needs of workers. So these are some of the interventions that UNI has also put out globally to ensure that um, its members are protected within, uh, during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Danas. Um, I think we'd like to see if Christian is able to, to connect this time. Um, Christian, in Zimbabwe, in the energy sector, um, what is your union doing to protect young workers? You mentioned earlier the um, slowdown on the challenges of uh, the energy sector and, and stopping of renewable energy projects. Um, but I guess the other question is, how do you feel like just transition fits into the COVID-19 recovery response as we're fighting for rights for young workers? Okay, thank you, Anna. I think uh, the trade unions in Zimbabwe have uh, tried to strengthen and capacitate uh, the resilience of the employees, employer organi employees organizations, uh, such as the workers' committee within the different workplaces where we are coming from. Because at the moment, um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the shutdown that has been imposed by the government, uh, the trade unions are not doing much. It's kind of difficult for them to then penetrate or engage in dialogue with the employers. Yes, they have since reverted back to strengthening uh, the capacity of the workers' committee within the different workplaces we are coming from to then lobby their employers in terms of uh, improving the conditions of service and in terms of uh, working on a moratorium of um, those that have been paid for. And uh, in Zimbabwe, we also have uh, the ZPTU, which is our um, federation, the biggest federation that represents the workers within the different sectors. They've also successfully managed to work on a moratorium of um, six months uh, payments to those uh, workers that are being laid off and that are going to be sent back in home. And we also have um, the um, Sub-Sahara Regional Youth Committee, uh, which I am the vice chairperson. Uh, we have uh, come up with a, a list of uh, political demands and um, the demands that are um, pertinent to the worker issues and that are relevant to the youth, especially on the issues of retrenchment and layoffs, because we've since um, realized that the employers are laying off 
young workers mostly because they are less costly and they are using the LIFO. And yet, as a regional committee, we have since lobbied the different governments um, through our different committees within the different countries and affiliates that we come from to then lobby our government to say that they should reconsider the LIFO approach that is being used by the employers. And we have since launched a, a number of campaigns through social media, uh, whereby we conscientize the workers on the need to embrace Industry 4.0 and the just transition. Because in as much as we want to say that uh, just transition or Industry 4.0 is not yet here, but it has come when we least expect it to be here. And we are then uh, focusing on our, on, on our campaign on the unions to then increase their membership so that they then seek to acquire skills that are in line with uh, Industry 4.0 and Just Transition. Because as we look at Just Transition, it's going to come and most workers are going to lose their jobs because they will not be uh, skilled uh, to the, in, in, in terms of, of the requirements of the employers. Yes, we really need to then uh, invest in educating our members to reskill themselves for them to be, uh, to continue being employed when just transition, just transition happen in the industry 4.0 it is happening. Because the COVID-19 has also given an opportunity to the employers to then realize that they can sometimes do away with employees in the workplace. The employees can work from home. Yes, Industry 4.0 is here. And the trade unions are not prepared for Industry 4.0. So we are uh, launching campaign, campaigns and awareness on social media through our um, Facebook pages, through Twitter, um, uh, the various channels. And as a um, committee in Sub-Sahara, the youth committee, uh, we, we had met in Ghana to then formulate our action plan and take to guide us as a committee. But the action, in the action plan, we had planned to then formulate uh, committees within the different countries that do not have committees of young people, the industrial or youth committees. And as of now, I can successfully report that uh, in Kenya, we now have a committee that, that is in line with our original committee because we have a committee of uh, the chair, the vice chair, the secretary, and four committee members that have different portfolios. Uh, among the portfolios is the social media and campaigns, we have the industrial policy. Um, we also have um, a, the other two portfolios uh, for, the, for the committee. Hence, we have then co we have formulated committees in Kenya and in Zambia, they formulated a committee in line with the regional committee. So that we don't have uh, committee members that are just there as placeholders, but that are there to then work on the different campaigns that were um, that are taking place within the the region within Sub-Sahara, so that we conscientize the young people. And in most cases, we are then going to the universities and roping in the young people that are still in school, so that they know the importance of joining a trade union so that they know why they need to be a trade union member because sometimes they do not know they venture into the they venture into the in, 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 into employment without knowing the importance of being a trade union and sometimes it's kind of difficult for us to then go in those young people to come and be union members and we need to also go in those young people whilst they're at school so that they appreciate the work that is being done by the trade union and also the informal sector. Because at the moment, almost 90% of the population are young people and they are unemployed. They are in the informal sector. So for the informal sector to organize with only 10% of them being formally employed, it's kind of Thank difficult. you, Christian. So
We're, we're just ab out, about out of time. So I wonder if you could just wrap up your comment very briefly. All right. So basically, that's what we're doing. We are venturing into campaigns and um, advocating for, for, for and mobilizing young workers within the different sectors in the universities and in the informal sector. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Well, of course, as with every great discussion like this, we don't have enough time. Um, there are so many more questions and there's so much more that we want uh, these panelists to share that we don't have time for. Um, I think for me, this has highlighted that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted young workers' lives at home and at work across all sectors, across all parts of the world. And um, it has been a very challenging time so far for many of us uh, personally and for many of the workers in our unions. Um, but personally, I am very um, uh, encouraged that we have young leaders like these panelists who told us about the work that they're doing in their unions to connect with young workers through technology like Monica's doing or work with migrant workers who are in very challenging situations like Gopi or um, contact having a contact for young workers and, and making sure those voices are heard like dentists. Um, and hopefully uh, the next time we all talk, Felia won't have that that huge sigh at the beginning and, and we'll, um, we'll have a, a, hopefully a, a better discussion that, that things will be in a better place for young workers around the world. Um, so I, I want to thank all of our panelists um, and I want to thank the interpreters who made this possible that we could all talk and understand each other. Um, and I just want to say uh, we're all in this together, um, solidarity, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, and please, please join our next session. We'll have another similar discussion like this on the 28th of July. You should see an announcement come out um, later with the, the um, details to register. So I hope everyone has a good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.